Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we just want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have of being here in your house of worship this morning. Father, we just want to thank you for your love for each one of us and your grace, Lord, as we've just been singing. Father, we've got so much to thank you for. We're just so grateful for the sacrifice that you made on Calvary for each one of us. That Jesus paid the price for our sins, for us. And we have the hope of eternal life if we trust in you. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, that Adrian is here this morning to bring to you, to bring to us your words of encouragement. And Lord, we just might have our hearts open, our minds clear that we can understand the things that he has for us this morning. Father, we think of those that aren't with us today, those, aren't, those that aren't well, Lord, we just pray that you'll be close to each one, particularly, Lord, our sister Joy. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you've been with her, and we just pray again that you'll be close to her, particularly today, your Sabbath day. We pray, for, Father, too, for our, our children, our teens, our youth. Lord, we just pray that you'll be close to them, encourage them to keep close by your side. Father, we think too uh, of our fathers, not only tomorrow but each day, Lord, we just pray that you'll give them wisdom and guidance each day in whatever they are responsibilities are. Father, again, we just want to thank you that we can be here today, and Lord, that we might be conscious of your presence right here in our midst, and that we might be faithful to you in all that we do, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning to you this morning. Right, let me tell you where we're going today so you can follow with me. Over the last few uh, weeks when I've had opportunity to speak with you and to preach here, you will notice probably that there's been a bit of a consistent theme that, we, that I've been building on. Today continues that journey. We've looked at various aspects over the last uh, two or three visits that I've had with you in terms of this whole concept of grace and faith and salvation. And uh, while we've looked at a few small little parts uh, in detail, today I want to take on the daunting task of trying to paint the macro picture for you from beginning to end. And so you're going to hear some things coming up which you might think, hey, he preached about that last week or the week before at least. But uh, we're going to build on that foundation and go a little bit further today. So forgive me if some of this is a bit new to you. There are three big words we're going to be looking at today, which I'll reveal in a little moment. And the reason I'm going to mention those three big words is because if you spend time reading your Bible, you're going to find those three big words right there in the Bible. And so we're going to be unpacking the meaning of those three words as we discover them through our journey in the Scriptures uh, this morning. So I've entitled the message this morning, Full Reconciliation from Beginning to End. And what I want to do is have you turn with me uh, for, for a moment to our first text for the, eve for, for the morning, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Throughout this message this morning, I'll be using a New King James Version and just invite you to 
following whatever translation you have. In an effort to move kind of quickly this morning, I've put most of the text on the screen, except these first two that I want to share with you. The first two texts for this morning are the glue. They are the glue that caused the rest of our, of our subject this morning to fit together, to be glued together as it were. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, it says the following. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we employ, implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As if God were pleading through us, we implore you, be reconciled to God. What is the key word there? Reconciled. So let's just review what we looked at last time I was with you. We said that reconciliation is the theme that binds together. It is the end game in the salvation plan for God. What does God get out of salvation? Where is He going with this? What does He hope to accomplish? Well, forgiveness, we said, was just a means to the end. Reconciliation is the end game. Face to face with God, reconciliation, an experience which begins down here. Be reconciled to God, not in the future, not one day, today. Be reconciled to God. That is the great glue that binds the whole plan of salvation together, the great end game, the purpose, what God gets out of it. You, in His presence, face to face, for all of eternity. That's what's in it for Him. That's what He wants. That's where the plan of salvation meets its fulfillment. Be reconciled to God. Our next text picks up on that theme, Colossians chapter 1, from verse 19. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 19 and it says the following it pleased the father that in him that is in Jesus all the fullness should dwell now that that fullness there you'll discover in the next chapter it's speaking about the deity of God in other words in Christ it pleased the father that in Christ should be the fullness of everything that God is so that Christ is both man and God because that is fundamentally how the reconciliation takes place and that's what we're going to discover as we carry on reading here the reconciliation has already taken place in Christ humanity and divinity have been inseparably united for all of eternity in the person of Christ Human beings and God have been bound together in the body and the person of Christ. And that becomes the starting point for the whole concept of salvation and what it means for you and I to be reconciled to God. So it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. To reconcile all things to Himself. So there was once... A state of being in which all things were united in God. Sin brought a separation. Sin brought a, a disconnect from the presence of God. But God has refused to let sin have the last word. And so in the person of Christ, his mission has been to reconcile all things back to himself. I want you to know this about the concept of salvation. It is relational. All the language that you will be reading about today, it is relational. It is about you connecting with God, entering into relationship with Him. The hows, the wherefores, the whens, all of that stuff we're going to unpack today. But firstly and fundamentally, reconciliation is a relational word. It implies the necessity of relationship. Are you with me? Second of all, in the description of what happens in reconciliation, the nature of the language is also relational. He is reconciling to himself. God is personally involved. God is the end point, the destination for everything that has been separated from him. He's bringing it back into his presence to be united with him, right? It pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. No more enmity, no more fighting, no more separation. Peace with God through the blood of the cross. 
And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Reconciliation. How does it happen? From the text we've read, we have an insight. It happens in the person of God, in the person of Christ. And the person of Christ is in the person of God, right? All the fullness of God dwells in Christ. He's also the fullness of what it means to be man. So the moment that God enters into human flesh, reconciliation has begun to take place. But justice must still be served. Because the very ones that he is reconciling are alienated, rebellious, in the wrong. How does God reconcile while still remaining just and fair to the universe, to the human race? Remember that in the whole concept of salvation, and this text brings it out nicely, there is a lot more at stake in salvation than merely your forgiveness, merely your personal reconciliation with God. How God deals with you reflects on the very character and nature of God himself. In other words, if, if God has the noble purpose of reconciling you to himself, but goes about it in a way that denies the very principles of justice and fairness that are the foundation of the universe, then where would that leave the universe in reconciling you in that way? The whole of the universe would call into question the character of God. He would lose more by reconciling you in an unjust way than to leave you to be lost. Because while he might gain you, he would lose the loyalty and the stability of the universe. How does God reconcile an alien, rebellious, stubborn race while still being seen to be just and fair in all his dealings? He takes this job into his own being. He unites himself to this race so that he can represent them before the Father. In judgment and in salvation. What do you mean in judgment and in salvation? At the cross, Jesus bears humanity, you and me, in judgment. So that Paul can write in other places that at the cross, you died in Christ. You, the one that God has incorporated you in the same way that you were incorporated with Adam in the very beginning and you fell with Adam when he fell. Romans chapter 5 makes it clear that you and I stand in solidarity with Christ because in his being, he has taken the whole of humanity into his being so that at the cross, this human race dies at the cross for the penalty of their sins. Justice is served. But the amazing thing is, he doesn't pour that justice out on you personally. He pours that justice out on himself. And being fully one with us means that he is able to do that. Because he is us. He is one with us. He's not doing it on some foreign alien victim, as it were, like an angel would be. He takes that being, he takes our being into his being, unites them, so that at the cross, you are carried in judgment. Justice is served. Humanity has died in Christ. But in Christ means that God has taken the humanity into himself. Does that make sense to you? So that when God pours out his hatred for sin and his judgment, is as much as the human race is represented there, it is the divine being which suffers the judgment. At the cross, you have the wrath of God poured out onto his own being. And that's fundamentally, by the way, what makes Christianity so unique in comparison with other religions. Because in other religions, you're trying to appease an angry God. And there's always some other third party victim who has to be the offering to appease this angry God. In Christianity, you have God stepping in himself, taking this rebellious race into his own being so that in a sense, the race itself bears its own judgment. And yet the race itself bears its own judgment in the person of God. So that it's not an angry God, which you and I have to satisfy. It is God himself who deals with our sin in his 
his own being. He takes our judgment into himself. So that justice having been served, he is free at his discretion to redeem anybody that he pleases. Because there is no reason why anybody need bear their judgment. Their judgment has already been born. That is what God has done for us, objectively, outside of ourselves, indisputably, irre irrevocably. Nothing can change that fact, what Christ has done for the entire world. There is only one variable in this equation, and that is the individual's choice as to whether they will recognize what God has done or not. Objectively, every human being was redeemed at the cross. Every human being was objectively justified and redeemed at the cross, because at the cross, every sin was atoned for. Everybody past, present, and future was redeemed at the cross. And yet the scriptures tell us the sad reality that not everybody will be saved. So how can everybody be, as it were, objectively justified and redeemed, and yet not everybody be saved? Because there is one variable in the equation. Only one thing that God has put on you. And that is that you have to decide whether that whole story is for real or not. You have to decide whether you will trust your life with this God who has done this amazing thing, or whether you're going to write it off as too good to be true, or as a fairy tale, or as whatever else, whether you're just going to allow yourself to be so distracted that you don't have time to contemplate these realities. Whatever it is, God has only given you one part to play in this whole grand scheme of events. He has done everything that needs to be done to redeem every son and daughter of Adam. Everybody that has fallen has the opportunity to be saved. They simply have to recognize what God has done and choose to accept it as done for them personally. That leads us to a series of verses that speak in this language. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And you remember our definition of faith that we came up with last time I was here two weeks ago. Faith, taking away all the mystical interpretations, is very simply choosing to believe that God is for real. Choosing to believe that God is trustworthy. That what happened actually really did happen. I believe it. It's a fact. He's done it. And it is sufficient. If he says so, I believe him. That's what faith is. If, if you have faith in me, it means you trust me. It means you take me at my word, right? If I come to you and I promise to do something for you, your choice is to say, you know what? He's for real, that guy. Or your choice is to say, don't trust him. If you decide that I am for real, that I'm trustworthy, and that I'll do what I say, then you have faith in me. Same thing with God. Same thing with God. You are, here's that fancy word, the first of our three, justified. Justification, justified. First big word. It simply means that you are made right with God. And what is the basis for being made right with God? Everything we started with that God has done, He has done this deed for us. He has come down to this earth. He has united Himself with humanity. He has poured out His life as an offering. He's lived the perfect life that no one else has ever succeeded to live. And He has exchanged places with you and me so that because of Christ, all of humanity has lived a perfect life. And because of Christ, all of humanity has been judged for its imperfections. Do you believe that or not? It's as simple as that. If you choose to believe that and to believe it in a personal way, then that's the basis for you being justified. That is to say, being made right with God, where your whole history of sin and rebellion and anarchy is forgotten by God, and you are before God as if you had never sinned. And he makes it clear that there is no behavior that can atone for your past life. That's what he means by we are not justified, not made right with God by our works. Your works, no matter how good or pure they are, even when compared with your, with your naughty neighbor next door, will not make you right with God. There is only one thing that will make you right with God, and that's what God has done, and your choice to believe it for real. Faith. 
Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified, made right with God by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law will no flesh be judged. Here's another one for you in Romans chapter 4 verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. So just you saying to yourself, saying to God, in fact, I believe you, you are for real. What you have done is not only a historical fact, but I accept it as the gift it's intended to be. When you make that conscious choice to receive the gift, he says, because you have believed me, I account you as righteous. I declare you to be righteous. I give you the perfect life of Christ to stand in the stead of your imperfect life. And all you've done is chosen to believe him that he will do it. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, the one that we were reading from two weeks ago. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're made right, there's no more enemies, there's no more fighting. We are made one with God. The very first, I hope you're noticing this, the very first step towards salvation on your part is the believing. And that is what we call justification. You are made just or right with God. Are you with me? So there is what Christ has done. Without what God has done, it wouldn't matter if you believed him or not. God has had to actually do something in the space of human history. And that's the story of Jesus. What he has done in human history is an object of fact. You cannot change it. You cannot go back in time. It is accomplished. It is a done deal. Are you with me? You simply have to decide how you relate to that. Do you receive it or not? That's where your spiritual journey subjectively begins. Are you with me? That's where your spiritual journey subjectively begins. That's the first step, the place at which salvation becomes a personal, guaranteed reality for you. The day you choose to believe God and take Him for real. You are made right with God. Just like that. Simply because of everything He's done historically and because you've chosen to believe it. At that moment, you are saved. At that moment, your destiny is secure. At that moment, you are forgiven. At that moment, you have peace with God. You are no longer an enemy of God. You are a friend of God. He has loved you before you were his friend. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. He's done everything historically that needs to be done in order to ensure that you would become his friend. But friendship is a two-way street. While he has done what he needs to do, you need to do what you need to do, which is choosing to believe it, receive it, accept it. Faith. And you are justified, made right with God, welcomed into his friendship, and God does not destroy, judge, or annihilate his friends. So having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament, beautiful, beautiful passage. It says, he shall see the labor of his soul. This is after describing his sufferings and his murder, his death, and all of that in your, for your salvation. All that historical fact, it takes a little glimpse into the future. And it says, he will see the labor of his soul. What he went through it for, you know, you in the presence of God, he will see you, the labor of his soul, and be satisfied and say it was worth every moment of suffering, every moment of pain, every moment of alienation for my father on your behalf, just to have that end game of reconciliation. You face to face with God. He says every moment of it was worth it because that's how much he loves you. By his knowledge, my righteous servants shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Another way we might describe this justification process, this experience of being made right with God, is the moment you choose to believe, he forgives your history. Forgiveness is the starting point. The book of Acts chapter 13, verse 38 to 39 reads, Through this man, Jesus is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, everyone who believes is justified. Do you see forgiveness and justification overlapping there in that text? That's 
simplest definition that I can come up with for justification. Forgiveness. And if you're forgiven, you are made right with God. And by Him, everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Again, it is not based on your behaviors. It's based on what God has done historically and your simple choice to accept it as a reality and to receive it personally. So justification is the starting point for your subjective experience of salvation. Now, the starting point for salvation history is way back in the beginning. The book of Revelation says the, la the lamb slain since the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation has been there and has been put into operation from the very moment that we fell. But your personal journey in the experience of salvation is when you choose to believe that historical story, that reality of what God has done and already accomplished in your behalf as your personal story. Then you begin your friendship with God. It's the starting point. It is the work of a moment. The amount of time that it takes you to make the choice to believe is the amount of time that it takes God to account you as righteous. Does that make sense? It is accomplished by grace through faith. Grace is God's initiative. It's what He has done in the history of salvation. While you were yet a sinner, He was working out the plan of salvation. He was accomplishing all these things that needed to be done in order to offer you this gift. That's the grace of God, what He has done. Faith is your choice to receive that as done for you. So justification the starting point of your personal spiritual journey, the place where salvation happens. We sometimes call it in Christian circles, conversion. Conversion. It's a work of a moment by grace through faith. It can be described as the gift of forgiveness. And it is when we talk about the concept of reconciliation being the glue that binds this whole thing together, we can call it relational reconciliation. Because when you read the language of Scripture, it speaks about us right now being reconciled to God. Not one day. Today, you are reconciled. The relationship, in other words, has been healed and restored. When you carry on reading scripture, you'll find that God has something far more than just this step for you. This is fantastic news as it is, but this experience of being made right with God by choosing to believe in what He has done for you historically follows on logically to a new phase of your human existence. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11 makes it clear. It says, Do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what do you mean by the unrighteous? What are you talking about? Do not be deceived, he says. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, the covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says something profound. And such were some of you. What's he saying to the Corinthians? <laughs> I'll tell you what he's saying to us. He's saying human nature hasn't changed. Human nature hasn't changed since the time when the Gospels were written. Since that historical moment when God intervened in human history and sent Christ and set the ball in motion for our salvation and raised up the early church. The people back there, the sinners back there struggled with the same stuff you and I struggle with. So homosexuality is not a 21st century phenomenon. Murder is not a 21st century phenomenon. Anger is not a 21st century phenomenon. All the stuff we try and excuse today has always been there. And such were some of them. But the power of the gospel, the belief in Christ, radically changed and transformed their lives. They were not only forgiven. They were changed. They were changed. They didn't make all sorts of excuses and say, I was born this way. I was raised this way. Sin is sin. I don't care whether you inherit it or whether you choose it. Sin is sin and it will alienate you from the presence of God. And God has provided a solution for it. 
So let's not hide behind, I'm so weak, I'm so poor, poor me. God has provided a solution, and your choice is whether you believe that or not. And if you do, there is salvation. If you do, there is more than just, I'm going to forget your past. If you do, such were history 